Okay, so you've just seen the first failure of projector. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk, uh, so you, we all heard about uh, the amazing uh, uh, abilities of uh, deep learning. Um, I'm going to talk about what doesn't work. Um, now, uh, this, these failures uh, do not stem from uh, just uh, wanting to uh, destroy the party. Um, I'm using deep learning all the time. Um, I'm doing a lot of work on autonomous driving. Uh, I have some videos, but I don't know if it will work. Um, okay, so let's see at least. So these are um, car detection uh, in Paris. Uh, they're on the background, Arc de Triomphe. Um, so this technology is solely based on deep learning. Um, this shows uh, the difficulties of uh, detection in, uh, under different light conditions. Um, this green carpet is a um, detection of what we call the free space. This is where we can go. Um, as you can see, there is, uh, it's very difficult to understand the difference between the road and, say, what's going on here. Okay, <coughs> but still, using deep learning, uh, we can do this. Um, oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is um, the way from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. Uh, the car drives itself, and I'm sitting behind the the driver's seat and uh, <coughs> taking films using my uh, smartphone. Uh, you can see the leg of my wife on the right. <laughs> 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 I'm going to the beach. She trusts so you. you can see. <laughs> um, this is again in Jerusalem during winter time. Um, so as you can see, uh, we can um, do a lot of things. Um, it's not only supervised learning. Um, this is um, a result of a double merge situations. Cars coming from the right and from the left. Some needs to go to the left. Some needs to go to the right. So the red cars need to go to the right. The white cars need to go to the left. What you see here is reinforcement learning. Again, uh, using deep learning as a function approximation. <coughs> um, there is a complete symmetry between the cars. So they should negotiate learn how to negotiate with each other. Um, and if you want to know why this is needed, um, so this is um, uh, a roundabout next to my house. Um, you can see it's the same scenario. There is double merge. Uh, if, there will, if there was sound, you, you can hear them shouting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see it again. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so when when we when we um, <laughs> you see the complexity of the task. <laughs> so a lot, a lot is going on, <coughs> um, and this is nothing. <laughs> India, <laughs> you should uh, negotiate with others as well as give the right of way to cows, if you can see the cow in the middle. <coughs> okay. Um, and deep learning is really amazing. Um, some of us made money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but this talk is about the failures of uh, deep learning. So what, what I want to show here is that simple pro there are simple problems, uh, problems where standard algorithms for deep learning either does not work well um, or does not work at all. Um, 
And the main message that I would like to convey is that we still need prior knowledge. We still no need to understand what we are doing. Uh, we may need to uh, rethink about uh, what supervision we are giving to the algorithms. At, at least uh, the current moment, um, uh, the, the deep learning algorithm does not solve everything. And I would like to try to, uh, to give intuition uh, about um, when and why th uh, things doesn't work. I, didn't, I forgot to mention because of the projectors, this is a joint work with Ohad Shamil, who is sitting here, and Shekhar Shama, a student of mine. Okay, so I'm going to present four families of uh, failures. Um, it comes from examples. The first example is piecewise linear curves. Um, then we will talk about flat activations, end-to-end -end training, which is very, very popular, but I will show that it can be harmful for the optimization part. And at the end, a more theoretical explanation using um, the problem of learning many ortho orthogonal functions. So let's start with the piecewise linear curves. And the motivation, as you, as you saw before, the motivation is obvious. Uh, if you want to understand the free space, uh, you can model it very, very nicely using a piecewise linear curve. If, if I will let each one of you to uh, paint uh, the, the edge of the free space, you will probably use a piecewise linear curve. Okay, so let's take, forget about the image and everything, and let's just look at a very, very simple problem. I give you a representation of a piecewise linear curve by just giving you, uh, dis discretizing uh, the x-axis and giving you a vector of the y values of the piecewise linear curve. I denote it by f. Okay, so f0, f1 is the value of the piecewise curve at 0, 1, 2, 2, n minus 1. So the resolution is n, okay? And a piecewise linear curve can be written if we have k curves. So we need to know the theta r, where are we changing the slope? And a r is a, the slope at each, uh, at each uh, change of slope. Okay, so a very, very simple problem. I give you f, I want you to give me the parameters of the curve, which are a and theta. So it's 2k numbers. I give you n numbers, and you should give me 2k numbers. There is no image, it's just, you know, very, very simple. Much simpler than what you saw before, the success stories of, uh, of deep learning. Okay, so let's, let's, let's see what's going on. Um, so the first try is to use a deep auto encoder. So we will learn one network, which will, we will be the encoding network. We call it E of W1. The architecture is just uh, two uh, uh, dense layers with ReLU and another dense, uh, dense layer without ReLU. Then there is a decoding back from the 2K number into the N. And we want the square loss, we want that if we apply the encoding and then the decoding, we end up with the same vector, okay? And we know that it is doable, okay? So it is possible to express this piecewise linear curve using these t 2K numbers, okay? So we can apply it, run it, and it doesn't work so well. So what you, sh what you see here on blue is the original curve, on red is after encoding and decoding, and after 500 iterations, you see that it you know, looks pretty bad. It starts to look better as you perform more and more iterations, but even after 50,000 iterations, it still doesn't capture the edges and it's not very accurate on the side. And this is you know, su such a simple task, you would expect that after 50,000 iterations, you will be able to do something better. Okay, so let's, let's think about the problem and try to, uh, to do something better. Um, so actually this problem, you can pose it as a convex optimization problem uh, the following way. So recall we have a vector f and we, we, we need to output the curve parameters. Let's think about a vector p. Um, sorry, this, this is a typo, it should be just n-dimensional vector, which is all zero except at k places. At the k places, the max value and the argmax value represent these two parameters, a and theta. So um, we have n values. We, we look at uh, the position theta, and we put there the change, of, the change of slope. And then it is not very difficult to see uh, that we actually k 
can write a linear relationship between f, between the vector, and this sparse vector that rep whose non-zero represents a change of, of slope. And the matrix uh, that uh, connects them is a matrix, uh, it's actually a toplitz matrix, a very simple matrix. The ij element is just i minus j plus one value. Okay, so now we can uh, try to learn it uh, using linear regression and apply SGD for solving this uh, linear regression problem. Okay, so the same algorithms with, that we use for deep learning, but, but, but now the, the actual the network is not very deep, it's just one linear layer. Shai? Yeah. So you have a nonlinearity w because it's a ReLU inside a square. So this is just for the definition of w, okay? But the problem itself that you need to figure out what is the value of the inverse of w, okay? So we, you don't need to learn uh, this relationship between i and j to w. You just need to every element of the matrix to find what it is, like just like linear regression, okay? So the, the input is f, the target is p, and you want to learn the inverse of w, which would denote by u, all right? Um, so it's, um, it's a convex optim uh, optimization problem, we, we run it. Now we see that uh, it works maybe a little bit better than the autoencoder that we saw before, but still, uh, even after 50,000 uh, 50, iterations, you can see here that it's still not perfect. Okay, so now it's a convex problem. We know that it should converge, and, it, and indeed it will converge, but not after 50,000 uh, iterations. It needs more iteration. So what's going on? So what's going on is that the convergence of stochastic gradient descent is governed by the condition number of W transpose W, this matrix. So you can do the calculation, we do it in the paper, and uh, the, uh, the condition number of this matrix grows with the resolution of the image that we are working on. So if we're working in resolution of n pixels, then you, you need n to the power of 3.5, at least n to the power of 3.5 iterations, so as to get a solution which is reasonably good, okay? Um, and using uh, more sophisticated variants of uh, gradient descent like Edegrad or Adam will not work because they perform diagonal conditioning and here uh, diagonal conditioning doesn't work, okay? Um, so what, what can we do? So the next step is let's think about uh, the problem a little bit more and observe that we can actually calculate the inverse of W and see that it's a very simple matrix. All of it is zeros except three uh, numbers which are just shifted every, war, uh, every row. So multiplying f by w minus one is in fact a one dimensional convolution. So now we can pose this problem as actually learning a single convolution of three numbers. So the problem become a problem in, in three dimensions, okay? And it, it can express, still can express this uh, problem, this problem of uh, finding piecewise linear curves. So I'm just showing you, this is a very, very simple task. And still, even though we put it in three-dimensional space, so now after 50,000 iteration, it finally works, okay? But after 10,000 iteration, it doesn't work, okay? So to learn three numbers, we need 50,000 iterations. And you can actually calculate the condition number of this problem and finally, you gain something. In instead of n to the power of 3.5, now it, it is n to the power of three. Much better, but still lousy, okay? Um, so it's interesting to see that when we switch from a dense, a fully connected uh, layer to a convolutional layer, we gain in geometry, not just in sample complexity, okay? The geometry of the problem becomes better, okay? But still, n to the power of three for learning three numbers, this is disappointing. Okay, so can we do something better? Actually, we can, if we think about it as a problem in three dimension, if it's only three dimensions, we can perform preconditioning, but not diagonal preconditioning, but full preconditioning. And if you do this, then um, the condition number becomes close to one. You can estimate the covariance matrix very, very easily, and now, things really works. So now even after 500 iter iterations, we are perfect, okay? 
So um, we use ConvNet, because we use convolutions instead of fully connected, we get the ability to perform preconditioning efficiently because now we, we just need to uh, precondition a matrix of three by three uh, instead of n by n for, for a dense layer. So the lesson learned from this first example, uh, first, SGD might be extremely slow, okay, even for simple problems. And if we use prior knowledge about the problem, it can help us to choose a better architecture from the problem. And the better architecture is not used here for, 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 for expressing the problem better. The better architecture is just used for a better geometry of the objective. Uh, and then we can also choose a better algorithm, preconditioned SGD, instead of just diagonal dominated uh, precondition of the SGD. OK. Can't you achieve it with the full version of undergrad? Full, full version of undergrad is uh, full, uh, full uh, <coughs> preconditioning. Yeah. This will work perfectly. But you cannot do it on the matrix of n by n. This is why you need to think about the architecture. OK, so next, um, next failure, uh, flat activations. So um, activations, activation functions like uh, tangent hyperbole or, or sigmoids uh, have uh, vanishing gradients on the sides of the, of the activation. And, and they are used in many, many situations. For example, in uh, LSTMs, uh, we use uh, sigmoids as gates. Okay? And the problem is that um, if we, if we look at the gradient, the gradient, when you go away from, uh, from the middle of the sigmoid, it just goes to zero, okay? So let's take a more extreme uh, problem. And we have this activation function of uh, step steps, okay? This function that depicted here. And we just want a single linear layer, okay? And then uh, this nonlinearity of steps, okay? So the problem is, uh, learning the mapping from x to the application of this nonlinear function of steps u applied on a linear function. Okay. So we can write it as a, an optimization problem. And the problem is that uh, the gradient, no matter what function we will use here, um, maybe I, I will use this. No matter what, um, what network we will put here, uh, the gradient will go to 0 because u is almost everywhere zero. So we cannot apply gradient-based methods directly to this problem. Okay, so what can we do? Well, a simple approach is to smooth this uh, step function using sigmoids. So instead of uh, the steps, we will have smooth steps. Okay, we call it uh, u tilde. And this is sometimes work, and sometimes it doesn't work, and it depends a lot on the, on the initialization and it, it, it's a headache. Okay, so can we do something else? Um, okay, so maybe don't use this function at all. Just do end-to-end -end training, find uh, uh, some architecture without you at all that mimic this uh, target that we are trying to learn. Um, so it works, but look how it, uh, it's, you know, it's not what we want. Okay, it's close to it. It's not what we want. And also, it's very slow, uh, both for test and train time. Uh, and the curve is not captured well. Okay, so maybe we can do something else. Uh, we can think about this problem of steps as a multi-class problem. Every step is one label. Okay, so now it works better but it doesn't capture the boundaries because we, we, we simply uh, throw away all the structure that we know about this problem by going to multi-class. There is no ordering over labels in multi-class. Okay. So again, it's not a good solution. What we can do is to do something which is very similar to gradient descent, but not with a gradient. So descent, but not with a gradient. A function that looks like the gradient. Um, so we call it a forward-only backpropagation back or a for, forward-only layer. Um, so the idea, if you look at the objective, um, 
it looks like uh, u applied on wx minus u applied on w star x. And then if you, if you take the gradient, you see that you have the residual term, and then the gradient, the derivative of u, and finally the derivative of wx, which is simply x. So let's throw away this term because it annoys us. Okay? So let's throw it away. Okay? It's no longer breadth propagation. It's not gradient. And we will use a non-gradient direction, the residual time x. Okay? So we can think about it as a layer where in the forward pass, you perform the layer as is. But in the backward pass, you just think that the layer is identity. It, it sounds like you know, a, a miracle that this will help. But actually, there is a proof. And this algorithm is you know, a special case of, uh, uh, of the isotron algorithm of uh, Kala and Sastri and was uh, uh, analyzed explicitly in Kakade et al. Um, and you can actually show that uh, by applying L square over epsilon square iterations, if u is L Lipschitz, then this algorithm actually converges to the optimal solution, even though it's non-convex. Okay, um, so the lesson from this to learn is that sometimes local search works. So gradient descent is simply a local search. Okay, we just look locally, and according to this, we we update our our weights. Um, so here is an example where local search works, but not local search with a gradient. Local search with some other uh, direction. So again, thinking about about uh, the problem. Maybe we can come out with alternative algorithms that works better than gradient descent. Yeah. Isn't it just a scaled version of the grid? In some sense, you scale it um, uh, in some proper way, right? So scale. What, what do I what do I scale here? You move the scale, right, of the new prime. No, the, the gradient is zero everywhere, almost everywhere in this. So it's not the scaling; it's zero. No, it's almost zero. Almost. No, it, it, it is zero. I mean, yeah. in the original U, it, it is zero. OK? So it's you can think of those like a very small slope, and uh, then, uh, and, and then. And then, but, but, but by what you scale? I mean, it, it's not a constant scale, because if you approximate it by something smooth, then the scale factor depends on where you, where you are, which is exactly what you're trying to learn. So it's not a constant scale. It's a completely different search direction. I guess there is this cosy convex yeah, optimizer by Yilad and uh, of course, yeah, which scale the, the gradient problem. That that's true, but but again, it's not. I mean, the point here is that just you know using TensorFlow <laughs> as is will not work. <laughs> but uh, but uh, are you suggesting that flat activations are desirable for for so flat activation is desirable because if, for example, think about LSTM. You want the flat activation. You want a gate. What is a gate? Zero or one? No, I mean, the whole message of deep learning was to avoid flat, flat activation. Right? Always but, but sometimes you want, you want the flatness. So the current trick in deep learning is you want the flatness. You need to avoid the flatness. And then you start a bunch of heuristics in order to tune the initial value of the bias in LSTMs. Right? <coughs> So maybe you can avoid it by using different algorithms, which are not gradient-based. OK. Next failures. OK, so the next buzzword that you hear a lot is end-to-end -end training. OK, we didn't do anything. It's all learned by itself. OK, this is a lie. <laughs> OK, we did a lot of things. And at the end, we found how it will work by itself. <laughs> but to show it more work <laughs> yeah I, w I would like to show you two approach there are two approaches to tackling problems one is end-to-end -end, so you you forget about all the intermediate steps and just go to the end and backprop everything to all what is needed and a different approach is thinking a little bit more about your problem decomposing it to some subtasks and trying to put explicit supervision on subtasks and what I'm going to show you here is that, so there, there, are, many, there are many benefits of end-to-end, -end, OK? You don't need the extra supervision. You can, let, you can give the, the network more freedom. But I want you to see 
one aspect of end-to-end -end learning, there are problems when, where if you tackle them using end-to-end, -end, it will completely fail, while if you decompose and think about the problem a little bit more, then you can solve it very, very efficiently. So here is a problem. Um, the input is a k tuple of images of random lines. So think about k equals 3, OK? Um, so you see images like here, images like here. There is a single line on the image. And the slope of the line is either positive or negative, OK? So f1 of x for every, for every image, f1 of x determines whether the slope is positive or negative, OK? So if I have three images, f1 of x will be three numbers, OK? Determining for every image in the tuple if, it is, if the slope of the line in the image is positive or negative, OK? Then uh, we pass it into a second function, f2, which returns the parity of the slope signs. Okay? So it's just parity of three numbers. Okay? And the goal is to learn uh, the parity of the slopes. Okay? So let's see how it works. Um, the architecture, we took a concatenation of the Lenet architecture and uh, a two-layer ReLU linked by a sigmoid. Um, the end-to-end -end approach is just to train the overall network on the primary objective, namely the parity of the three, uh, of the three uh, images, of the slopes of the, of the three images. And the decomposition approach, we just add a little bit loss on the intermediate step, which is what is the slope of every image in the tuple. Okay? And of course, we also have the loss on the end-to-end -end loss on the uh, final prediction of the, of the network. But, but we guide it by using additional loss on the intermediate step. Um, so what you see here is a performance of uh, red and blue. Red is the end-to-end -end approach, and blue is the uh, approach with the decomposition uh, as a function of k. So for k equals 1, both of them works. For, for k equals 2, we see that, again, both of them works, but it's starting to be harder. For k equal 3, the, the composable approach works still very, very good, while the end-to-end -end approach keeps at a random chance. Sorry, what's the decomposition approach again? So um, we have two functions, OK? Um, so we build a network. The first network looks on the three images, OK? So the same network applied to the first image, to the second image, to the third image. And you get a number per image, OK? And then these. That's a slope, positive or negative. Positive or negative. And then these three numbers enter to a second network, which will give you the final prediction. So in the decomposition approach, you add a loss function on these three numbers according to the slope. And in the end-to-end -end experiment, you just have a loss function on the final prediction. And the, the composition, you supervise more. You supervise, you supervise more, exactly. You, you pay with supervision. You need more prior knowledge, of course. Okay? What, so the, the immediate idea is to, to say, OK, end-to-end -end is great. You need less supervision, no prior knowledge, just you know, feed it to the network and everything will work. What you see here is that it actually doesn't work at all um, with the end-to-end -end approach. While if you use the composition with the same architecture, so it's not a matter of expressiveness of the of the network. It's just a matter of optimization. Okay. So why end-to-end -end training doesn't work? So there was a similar experiment um, by a paper by. Gulcher and Bengio, um, and they suggest a local minima uh, problem for the end-to-end um, -end approach. And the decomposition approach guides the network toward a better global minimum instead of a local minimum. And we show that this is not a problem. And um, to, uh, I, will, I will show one graph here. And in the next section, I will elaborate on our explanation. Um, so what we, what we think is a problem is a signal-to-noise ratio in the gradient. Okay? So what do I mean by signal-to-noise ratio? Um, you can calculate 
the full gradient of the problem. So you take expectation over the entire space, okay? And so the gradient of the true objective of the generalization error. This is, this is, this is a, uh, the real thing that we want to update based on. But we don't see it. We just take either in stochastic gradient descent, we take a small mini batch, or in batch gradient descent, we still sample a training set and calculate the gradient on the training set and not on the true population. Okay? So we can uh, estimate the signal to noise ratio, the norm of the gradient, as opposed to the expected value of uh, the difference in norm between the true gradient and the estimated gradient. And intuitively, if the signal to noise ratio is bad, then you will not be able to converge using a, a gradient based algorithm. Okay, so what you see here is a, a, is a signal to noise ratio of uh, the end to end approach versus the decomposition approach as a function of k. So what you see is that um, the, the, the signal to noise drops very fast even for k equals two. But for k equals two, this is a very, very small gradient but still uh, above the precision of a 32-bit float number. For k equal three, then the signal to noise is below the precision of a 32-point number. So it means that if you use TensorFlow with 32 float numbers, then you, you have no hope to converge. Um, okay, so to elaborate on this last uh, message, let's take uh, a more synthetic <coughs> approach. Um, yeah, I'd like to comment on the claim about end-to-end -end training mm -hmm. in all claim because I was there. Uh, the claim was that suppose you want to recognize zip codes, you have to do several things, like find the zip code in the image, and then isolate the characters, recognize the characters, and we have several things. We can do everything with little learning system that we train separately. And put them together, sort of works. And the claim was that if after doing this, you start doing some fine tuning of everything end to end, it works better. That's I agree to this claim, and the experiment was not what we des you described, because I didn't train the first network, freeze it out, and then train the second one. That was the initial claim. Then the surprise was that in many cases, it works anyway. Yeah. But there was a surprise. Yeah. Yeah, so it, I agree. Uh, it's surprising that most of the time end-to-end -end works, yeah. okay, or at least in many times, in many practical situations. But you should be aware that if it didn't work, it doesn't mean that you have a problem with the expressiveness of the, <laughs> of the networks. Perhaps I should have used a deeper network or these claims. Maybe it didn't work because of the optimization aspect, and just by injecting a little bit more supervision to the problem, suddenly it will work. And I have seen such things in practice. Okay, so let's, let's uh, go one step and, and now do something which is a bit more uh, theoretically oriented. Um, so the problem is to learn many orthogonal functions. Um, so what do I mean by that? Uh, so you, we have a hypothesis class H, uh, and suppose that it contains uh, many orthonormal functions. And for simplicity, suppose that all the functions that we in the class that we want to learn are all orthonormal. This means that um, for every pair of h h prime in the hypothesis class, if you take the expectation <coughs> of h x h prime x, it equals zero. So they are not correlated. Okay? You can think about it as an inner product in the function space uh, between h and h prime. Okay. So we will want to learn h. And because it's the deep learning era, we will do it with a deep network, okay? So you will choose any architecture parameterized by a vector w. So pw is some function from x to the reals, okay? And you can choose any architecture that you want. The results that we are going to give here will hold for any architecture. Um, so what's the learning task? There is some target H in the hypothesis class. This is a function that we would like to learn. And what we, what we need to do is to minimize over the weights of the neural network the objective F sub HW, which is the expected value of some loss function of the prediction of the network parameterized by W on X uh, relatively to the real target function H of X. Okay? 
and the algorithm will start with a random W and then update the weights based on the gradient. So either by using the gradients or by using some uh, unbiased estimate of the gradient. Okay. So this is a framework that we consider, <coughs> learning uh, this class of orthonormal functions using a, a deep network architecture. Um, and to show that this is problematic when the size of H is large, the analysis tool will be to, to, to evaluate how much information there is in the gradient of F, H, and W, how much, how much information about the specific target function that we are trying to learn. So intuitively, if there is not, not uh, a lot of information in the gradient on the identity of the specific function that we are trying to learn, then learning will not succeed. OK, so what we show is that for every W, and in particular, you will start from some initial random W, so it will hold for your starting point. There are many pairs H, H prime of different function, and all our function to remind you are orthogonal, so two functions which are completely different. There is no correlation between these two functions. And if we look at the gradient of the objective for the target function being H, relatively to the gradient for the target function being H prime, then the difference between these two gradients goes to zero with the size of the hypothesis class. Would you get the same thing if you just look at the, at the H of all the single functions that are one at one point and zero at one point? Uh, on a finite uh, domain, this is this is an example of uh, this is an example, but but this is a, not a very good example because the number of such functions is just a dimension. What we will see in a moment is examples where the number of such functions is exponential in the dimension. Okay, and then you will not be able to learn it. Okay, so if if the number of functions in H is really really large, then by performing the gradient when the target function is h or h prime, you basically do the same thing, okay? So there is no chance that you will be able to converge to h and not to h prime, okay? So this is the idea. So what's, what's the idea of the proof? Uh, to prove this theorem, we calculate the variance of the gradient where the variance is thinking about a uniform distribution over the functions in H, okay? And then we can look at the average gradient when averaging is with respect to uniform distribution over functions in H, uh, as opposed to a specific function and taking square norm and expectation. So this is uh, the variance of this uh, gradient when we average over hypothesis in H. And uh, let's see how it works. Um, so intuitively, uh, let's, for, for simplicity, let's think about the squared loss, okay? So what is the gradient of F? It's the expectation of the derivatives of the square loss. So we have the residual term here, and then it is multiplied by the gradient of P of W, which is specific to the architecture. Now if we open it, then there is one term that does not depend on H, okay? So this will go out in the calculation of the variance because it doesn't depend on H. The only thing that depends on H is the expected value of the function H times the gradient. Now if we look at, uh, at this a little bit closer, fixing some coordinate of the gradient and denote it by G of X, since our function class is orthonormal functions, we can look, expand G using this basis. Okay, so we get a representation that depends on our functions plus an orthogonal, orthogonal component. And then when we look at the expected value now with respect to H, because of this decomposition, everything goes down and we end up with the expected value of GX square over H. So summing over all the coordinates, we will get the expected value of the gradient, which is usually a constant, this thing here over the number of functions. So this is, a, this is the idea of the proof. Okay, so now, yeah. Maybe uh, I have one minute, so maybe I will finish and then we'll an answer. 
Um, so uh, an example of such class is the well-known class of parity functions over the uh, cube, uh, the combinatorial uh, cube, where x is uniformly distribute, distributed. So there are two to the d uh, such functions. They are all they are all orthonormal. So it means that uh, if uh, for any initial uh, w, there are many many pairs of parity functions which are orthonormal, while the gradient between using h or using h prime is exponentially small. It means that you will not be able to solve it using floating point uh, calculations. Um, now, the, the result about parity is not new. Uh, there were similar hardness results uh, by combining existing results, but we think that this direct approach and connecting it to, uh, to deep learning, showing how it couldn't <coughs> be learned by a network architecture independent of the architecture is important. Let me just finish and then I will take uh, questions. Um, to, to understand what's going on, going on here, let's look at a little bit different scenarios uh, where we take the class H uh, to be cosine of inner product between W and X. Okay, so if we take the target function in two dimension to be just something that corresponds to the vector 2, 2, okay, and X is uniformly distribution, this is how F of W looks like. So what you see here is that there are no non-global uh, minima, okay? All the, all the local minima are also global, okay? There are also no saddle points. Still, the slope or the norm of the gradient almost everywhere is exponentially small. This is why no local search algorithm will work for such problems. Okay, and it doesn't matter what is architecture. Okay, so let me just wrap up and I will take questions. Um, so the cause of failures, um, optimization can be difficult for geometric reasons other than local minima and saddle points, as you saw in the last uh, slide. It can be condition number like we saw in the piecewise linear problem. It can be flatness like in flat activations or here in parity, and using bigger or deeper networks doesn't always help. Um, for some problem, we can find remedies by injecting more prior knowledge into the problem. It's just a different way to encode prior knowledge. So for example, convolution can improve the geometry, other than gradient update rule, or adding, adding directly more supervision by decomposing the problem and adding more loss functions. Understanding the limitations is very, very important. I think there is not enough research on understanding the limitations. Deep learning is really great, uh, but in order to make progress, especially in theory, but also in practice, we need to understand exactly the boundaries of what works and what doesn't work. And for more information, you can find the paper on archive and all the code that was used in, in the paper. Is on Thank you very much. I promise to learn. I have a question about the formulation of the last theorem. It says for every W, there are lots of HH prime for which the gradient says nothing. For different W, it's going to be different pairs. Yes. I think to claim what you say, you should say that there are lots of pair HH prime that for almost every W are not distinguishable. Mm -hmm. swap the that's, thing to that's true. But, but on the other hand, think, uh, yeah, I actually completely agree. Yeah, and we can do it as well, but it's more difficult. You need you need a concentration of measure, which shows that it holds almost everywhere. So uh, for this orthogonal problem, there is uh, a long study in the cold community where you look at columns of Hadamard matrices as your possible targets, and there the, the problem is linear, but anything trained with gradient descent including neural network, doesn't seem to be able to do it. We have a proof of one neuron, but not in general. Yeah. And the thing is, in that case, it's a linear problem. And if you switch the algorithm, you can learn it efficiently. That's true. Gradient-based. And you just have to go to the exponential gradient. I was wondering whether you. So, so, so what, what we prove here is that exponential gradient will not work as well. 
Uh -huh. Because the, the gradient, the norm of the gradient itself, of two different that's, target functions. Doesn't mean it's not doable because because you have a normalization. We have to be very careful. No, no, it's true because I mean it's true that you cannot do it with a floating point number, okay? Because the the noise will be larger than the precision of your so machine. I'm curious then, because in this Hardamard case, or you take a, a, a random matrix and you pick the targets as the column, it was linear. Exponential gradient could do it, but neural networks don't seem to. So that's a problem where you have an alternate algorithm. You don't seem to have an alternate gradient based algorithm. So it, it may be the case that the, the, it's almost orthonormal, but not completely no, orthonormal. Completely well, it won't work. OK, we'll discuss. We can take, OK. Uh, so maybe we should go so into the break, and yeah. maybe we can ask offline. Sure. And then we'll start the panel at 4.15 a little bit later. <laughs>